Welcome back, Bartonella buddies! Today I thought it would be useful to go over what the CDC gets wrong and right about Bartonella on their FAQs page. The point of this video is to merely give you the facts and to go over what the most recent high-quality research says about Bartonella. I understand that the CDC is a controversial topic and that many people have very strong feelings about the CDC, some of which may be considered conspiracy theories. <laughs> Conspiracies are, by definition, a group of people conspiring or joining together in a secret agreement to do an unlawful or wrongful act. Theories, by definition, may be true or untrue. There is vast disagreement over the validity of various conspiracy theories. Any comment verging on any type of conspiracy theory or anything political, I will delete. I've got the power! Ow! I just don't want anything distracting from the science. Side note, a conspiracy is also a group of ravens. You may write a comment about ravens if you so desire. Okay, I moved over here so we can put the CDC's page right here. So the FAQ's page starts with, I've been suffering from fatigue and memory problems for the past year. Should I be tested for, Bartone for Bartonella infection? Is that how they wrote it? For a Bartonella infection? Okay, that is how they wrote it. I have been suffering from fatigue and memory problems for the past year. Should I be tested for Bartonella infection? There are many reasons why people might experience fatigue and memory loss. True. It's unlikely that Bartonella is the cause of these issues. Work with your primary care physician to determine if a specialist is needed. I take issue with the word unlikely because I don't think we truly know how rare infection with Bartonella is. We know from mainstream medicine that the seroprevalence in the general population for Bartonella is around 4-6%, to and if they were to use a more sensitive test, I'm sure this number would be higher. Now, of course, having antibodies doesn't mean that you are currently infected, but it does indicate prior exposure. So if you randomly sample a population and approximately 5% have antibodies, what is the likelihood that a human encounters Bartonella at some point in their life? Dr. Breitschwert recently said in a webinar that most people will encounter Bartonella at some point in their life. That doesn't mean that they'll become sick with an acute or chronic manifestation, it just means that the bacteria is prevalent in our environment. How do we know this? Well, Bartonella species, of which there are over 36, have been found in the following animals. Cats, dogs, mice, rabbits, shrews, rats, voles, moles, gerbils, squirrels, groundhogs, deer, domestic cattle, sheep, horses. Elks, bats, I freaking love bats. Coyotes, foxes, wolves, mountain lions, bobcats, kangaroos. Porpoises, sea otters, dolphins, a pygmy sperm whale. At the love shack. Sperm was at the love shack. <laughs> and even sea turtles. We also know that Bartonell has many known vectors, all of which are acknowledged on the CDC website. The cat flea, human body lice, and sand flies that are found in the Andes region of South America. We also know that there are many suspected vectors, and by suspected, I mean scientists suspect that these vectors can transmit Bartonella, not because of necessarily of any experimental transmission studies, but because they have found Bartonella in the vector, or people have gotten sick after being bitten by the vector. Suspected vectors include various species of fleas, various species of biting flies, various species of mites, various species of lice, spiders, and of course, ticks. I will further address the topic of tick transmission later in this video. Given that Bartonella has been detected in such a wide array of mammals, and given that it's been detected in even non-mammals like sea turtles, and given that it's been detected in such a wide array of vectors, Dr. Breitschwert's statement truly checks out. So, when the CDC says it is unlikely that Bartonella is the cause of your fatigue and memory problems, perhaps that is still true, not because Bartonella isn't prevalent in our environment, and not because Bartonella can't cause those symptoms, but because there are a wide variety of illnesses that can cause those symptoms. However, if you've been assessed for many other illnesses and you still find yourself undiagnosed and mysteriously ill, then Bartonellosis is definitely something that you should be evaluated for by a Bartonella literate medical doctor. I heard that there are newer testing methods from laboratories that specialize in Bartonella testing. Are these new tests accurate? Although CDC typically recommends FDA clear tests, there are not currently any Bartonella tests on the market that meet this standard. This is true. There are no FDA cleared tests for Bartonella on the market, whether that be from big labs like Questor LabCorp or specialty labs. For example, if you go to LabCorp's website, it says, quote, this test was developed and its performance characteristics determined by LabCorp. It has not been cleared or approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The FDA has determined that such clearance or approval is not necessary. 
As I've said before, regulations around these kinds of tests only require that labs do in-house validation. What this means is that the lab can say how well their test performs based on validation studies they do themselves. It's almost as if you wrote a paper for a class, the teacher said that you could grade it and that she wasn't going to even look at it. Who wouldn't give themselves an A? My opinion on all of this is that it's bizarre. Okay, so then they say, there are some things that you should keep in mind when evaluating the accuracy of a lab test. First, any laboratory that performs Bartonella serologic testing should provide you with information regarding the accuracy of the test. That would be nice if labs provided the sensitivity and specificity of their tests, and some labs do provide this information, but once again, it's based off in-house validation studies. So we're supposed to just trust all of these labs because they said so? If you've ever had a parent justify their parenting by saying, because I said so, you know that this isn't the most convincing argument. Okay, so their next tip. Second, be aware that while some labs may report that their tests find 100% of infected patients, this is unrealistic. The potential for false positives and false negatives almost always exists. This is true. All tests, even the best designed ones, have a possibility for both false positives and false negatives, but this statement by the CDC isn't really all that helpful to help doctors and patients in determining what Bartonella tests are valid. Even quack labs or scam labs know not to report that their tests have 100% sensitivity. Even dictators know not to say they won 100% of the vote when they hold elections. They usually win somewhere between 90 and 99% of the vote. Much more believable. And this is their last tip. Finally, it is important for all abnormal test results to be interpreted with your healthcare provider in the context of your medical history. This is true, but once again, not particularly helpful or insightful. A more helpful way to phrase this sentence would be, it is important to consider all positive and negative tests in the context of your medical history, not just abnormal tests. Since false positives and false negatives exist, a negative test should not, on its own, rule out a diagnosis of Bartonellosis or any other illness for that matter. Tests have superseded clinical judgment in many, if not most, doctor's practices today, or at least that was my experience when I was jumping from doctor to doctor to doctor, desperately searching for a diagnosis in the mainstream medical community. In the alternative slash integrative medical community, I also see what I believe to be far too many physicians taking all positive tests at face value. False positives can hurt patients just like false negatives can, and not everything that you test positive for is necessarily contributing to your illness. Also, a lot of false positives are cross-reactivity, so you need a very, very discerning BLMD to sort all of this out. I don't know who or what is to blame for all of these tests, labs. <laughs> I don't know who or what is to blame for all of these labs sending out false positives, for all of these labs sending out false negatives, and for all of these doctors taking these tests at face value, but it's stupid for lack of a better word. Any final, very, very important word on testing for Bartonella. I've now told you that labs validate their own tests, so when they say that their test has, for example, 98% sensitivity and 99% specificity, this is just them giving themselves an A on their paper. So how are patients, and maybe even more importantly, doctors supposed to know which labs are grading their own paper with good science and integrity? I think doctors and patients just go off of a reputation of a lab. So what makes for a good reputation? Slick marketing? Getting in on the iLab circle? To me, those aren't the best ways to gain the trust of physicians and patients. What is more convincing is to publish in peer-reviewed scientific journals so that we, as consumers who pay a lot of money for these tests, can see what's going on behind a lab's closed doors x-ray vision. There is no way, no way to know what goes on behind the closed doors of a lab unless they publish in peer-reviewed scientific journals. See what you can find, which labs publish on Bartonella at all, and which lab publishes the most on Bartonella. Galaxy. 
This not only means more transparency for the patient and the doctor, but it also means that Galaxy is really trying to move the needle for patients with Bartonellosis so that one day the mainstream medical community will recognize that Bartonella is a major contributor to chronic debilitating illness. Okay, on to the next one. Buckle up, Bartonella buddies. I got a tick bite. My friend said I should get tested for Lyme disease and Bartonella. Is that true? I've done a full video on the research supporting potential tick transmission of Bartonella, so I won't go as in depth here, but I'll put the video in the description box down below. They say, we don't recommend it. To date, no study in the United States has shown that Bartonella can be transmitted to humans by ticks. Okay, so this whole sentence makes me laugh for a couple of reasons. One, why does the study have to be done in the United States? Would the study not be valid coming from any other country? Two, there would never be a study demonstrating the transmission of Bartonella to humans by ticks because that would never pass an ethics review board for an experimental study. Who's going to sign up to get bitten by ticks with Bartonella? I mean, maybe you're trying to get at the fact that no study to date has used an exodi species that is found in the United States. They've only used exodi species found in Europe, and therefore you can't definitively say that tick species found here can transmit Bartonella, but I feel like you can extrapolate a bit. So then they say, transmission studies with ticks have only used mice in artificial feeding systems. A single study showed that one species of tick in Europe could transmit a specific species of Bartonella to mice in a laboratory setting. I feel like these sentences, again, are a little bit misleading. In my previous video, Can Ticks Transmit Bartonella? I discuss both of these studies in detail. In sum, one study did use an artificial feeding system, which can be criticized as not really replicating what actually occurs in the natural environment, but the other study did not use an artificial feeding system. They used real live ticks. The next thing they say is, other studies have identified Bartonella in ticks, probably from ticks feeding on animals that carry Bartonella. This doesn't mean that the bacteria can be transmitted from a tick to a person, or that the bacteria can survive in the tick for any length of time. So let's address that first sentence. Once again, I don't find this to be a very accurate representation of the literature. Taking an engorged tick off a deer, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that the deer contracted the Bartonella from the tick. It could be the opposite way around, that the tick contracted the Bartonella from the deer. But we have several studies showing Bartonella in questing ticks, which are ticks that are waiting with their forelegs outstretched, looking to grab on to a new host. I'm gonna get you. Finding Bartonella in questing ticks shows that the ticks acquired the Bartonella at a previous life stage because ticks only feed once per life stage. So we have evidence that the Bartonella found in ticks isn't just because the ticks were pulled off a mammal that was already infected with Bartonella. Now on to the second sentence. So it is true that just because you find Bartonella in a tick, that doesn't mean it can transmit to humans, and it also doesn't mean that it can maintain the Bartonella for any length of time, but once again, I find these sentences to be a little bit misleading. Two studies have now shown that the tick Ixodes ricinus can maintain Bartonella from one live stage to the next for two different Bartonella species. So both studies showed that if you feed ticks at the larval stage infected blood with Bartonella, they maintain it through their molt to the next life stage, so the nymphal stage. And both studies showed that the Bartonella was still viable, aka alive and infective. In both of these studies, the time between molts for the ticks was at least two months during which the ticks were starved, which is how it happens in the natural environment. So that means that the Bartonella remained viable in these ticks for two freaking months. What I will say is that ideally we want more than two studies demonstrating tick transmission. 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 What I will say is that ideally we want more than two studies demonstrating tick transmission. <laughs> demonstrating tick transmission. What I will say is that we want more than two studies demonstrating tick transmission. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> That's the, the, the God's honest truth. <laughs> I like it a lot. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Now this sentence has become really funny. Okay. What I will say is that ideally we want more than two. <laughs> Maybe you just need to put subtitles on it and call it a day. What I will say is that ideally we want more than two studies demonstrating tick transmission. 
Oh, hip hip hooray. But since filming, my video can ticks transmit Bartonella. A new study was published on October 1st of this year demonstrating that the brown dog tick can become infected with Bartonella at the larval stage and maintain it through their molt to the nymphal stage. They weren't able to culture the bacteria, so it's unclear whether the bacteria were viable or not. Vector biologists won't be super convinced by this study. The most convincing study we have is the one where ticks were fed on infected mice. They maintained the Bartonella through their molt, and then they were fed on uninfected mice, and those mice became infected. We only have one study like that so far. So then they say, unfortunately, there's a great deal of misinformation regarding multiple tick-borne infections, called co-infections, on the internet. I would have to agree with this statement. There is a great deal of misinformation regarding co-infections on the internet, but that misinformation comes from both sides. And by both sides, I don't really know what to call each side, and I'm sure that there are doctors, activists, scientists that don't want to be labeled as being on a side. But for ease, let's just think of them by polite enough terms, the mainstream medicine side and the integrative medicine side. There is good and bad science on both sides. The integrative medicine side gave me a proper diagnosis that saved my life quite literally, and the mainstream medicine side would not have been able to do that at this point. At the same time, I feel like the integrative medicine side doesn't always do a good job at calling out bad science, or at least doesn't always use science that is quite up to snuff, and that's part of the reason why I made this channel. Not necessarily to get into heated debates about what constitutes good science, but rather to highlight the good science that I come upon. So the last thing they say is the possibility of having several tick-borne infections at once or having pathogens such as Bartonella that have not been shown to be tick-borne is extremely unlikely. There is a lot to be said about this sentence, but the last video I made was so long I almost had a nervous breakdown. I promise not to do that to myself again. Suffice it to say that we actually don't know how likely or unlikely it is for humans to contract Bartonella from ticks, but at this point, it's probably much more likely that humans get Bartonella from fleas more than ticks and cats. As far as co-infections go, unless we have good direct testing, as opposed to serologic testing, and unless we have good studies that are published in scientific journal articles, we don't know how likely co-infections are. And just because someone tests positive for a pathogen, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are symptomatic from said pathogen. We need to move away from a one pathogen equals one disease model and more towards where an imbalanced microbiome or in other words, a pathobiome develops and contributes to immune dysregulation. Our bodies are not sterile places. They're dirty as hell. And there's actually a lot of crosstalk between different species and even different genuses of microbes. And we have a lot to learn about how all of this plays into disease presentation. At the end of the CDC's page, they only cite two references out of everything that's ever been published on this topic. One of the references cited at the bottom is called Bartonella Species Transmission by Ticks Not Established. And that was published in the same issue of the journal, the CDC's journal called Emerging Infectious Diseases as a rebuttal article called Potential for Tick-Borne Bartonelloses. Why don't they include both of these references at the bottom so that the public can read and evaluate these two articles themselves? They talk about the two studies that show experimental transmission, the one that used an artificial feeding system and then the other one that used a rat model, but they don't cite them at the bottom. It would be more fair to actually put these references at the bottom. They haven't updated the page since January 2016. I hope that when they do, they include both sides. In the meantime, you can find both sides in my video description box. If you're new here, my name is Jake, and I would love for you to be my Bartonella buddy, and there are a few ways to do that. The first way is you can hit that subscribe button and like this video. The second way is you can join our Breaking Down Bartonella group, and the third way is you can follow me on my social media handles. Piper says, Jake, did you know that a group of bats is called a cloud, a colony, or a camp? That's the truth, Piper, and for kangaroos, it's called a troop or a mob. Bye, Bartonella buddies! 
whole list reminds me of in Spanish, we were made to memorize this chant of all of the Spanish speaking countries and their capitals in both Central and South America. Okay, so Central America is Mexico de F. Mexico, Guatemala, Guatemala, Tegucigal, Honduras, San Salvador, El Salvador, Managua, Nicaragua, San Jose, Costa Rica, Panama, Panama, La Habana, Cuba, Santo Domingo, República Dominicana. And then South America is Caracas, Venezuela, Bogota, Colombia, Quito, Ecuador, Lima, Peru, La Paz, Bolivia, Asuncion, Para Paraguay, <laughs> Santiago, Chile, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Montevideo, Uruguay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.